This is Patriot to the Core Podcast, and I am Thad Forrester. Thank you for tuning in now to part two of my interview with Johnny Spann. We're going to talk about his trip to Afghanistan, searching for some answers and trying to, to see where his son was killed and talk to people who were there. Uh, really appreciate Mr. Spann. Uh, he spent a lot of time with me and uh, to talk about his son, his son who voluntarily served who uh, left behind a wife and children and um, anyway it's been an honor for me to get to know to learn more about Mike and to to hear the determination in his father's in his father's voice of uh, just trying to find out everything he could about his son and to, and to get to the truth I mean, because because of his son being the first death in the war on terror in Afghanistan uh, there's been a lot of articles written and uh, a lot of false things printed as well and so his dad not only had to and just kind of deal with that but also sift through what was real and what what wasn't so we'll get in uh, I'll get back with Johnny now so we can finish talking about um, uh, his his trip to Afghanistan and more about his son and his son's final minutes on earth and how he fought and saved the lives of his teammates I wanted to start back with what Mike was doing, you know, in Afghanistan when he was he was interrogating or he was interviewing, you know, or you know, whatever he was doing with the, the prisoners there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, what actually happened? I think I, before we uh, left off there, I was telling you that I talked to him on Thursday. Right. Or did I did I tell you that part? You did. You sure did. Okay. So on. Uh, Sunday uh, morning, uh, Mike and uh, one of his partners there went up to College Yang, where the prisoners had brought, or some of the prisoners had been brought over to the Missouri Sharif area and housed in College Yang, which is just outside of uh, Missouri Sharif, and uh, had been put into uh, what we referred to as the pink house or the basement house uh, that Saturday night. And, um, Mike and his partner go over there the next morning, and the best I can tell in the time frame it, from the video, it looks like that they arrived about somewhere around eight o'clock, eight thirty, something like that. And before they got there, the uh, Northern Lights had already started pulling them out of the uh, basement house, pink house, and one by one. And uh, what they were actually doing was they would. Uh, bring one prisoner as before they brought him outside of that uh, building they would uh, take their turban off their head and uh, tie their elbows behind their back they didn't tie their wrists they tied their elbows behind their back that was their way of doing things and as they would bring them out on the courtyard uh, the the guy that was taking the video one of those men, men uh, he would was videoing the whole thing and they would they had a couple of guys uh, about 20 25 feet from the entrance to the building and the first thing when they brought a prisoner out he was interviewing him or asking him questions there they were uh, trying to determine and sort them out onto the courtyard there as to their nationality you know where they were from because most of these people were Al Qaeda, or a big majority of them were Al Qaeda, and uh, there was, was Al Qaeda and Taliban mixed. You understand that they were all fighting together. Okay. And uh, but Dostum, the way I understood, uh, Dostum had told us that he had made the agreement with them at their surrender that uh, if it was you know local Taliban Afghans that. Uh, they could surrender their weapons and he would turn them loose, let them go back to their homes. But the uh, Al-Qaeda members, the foreign fighters, uh, wouldn't be able to do that. And I think there was some uh, uh, unrest as far as not knowing what was going to happen to the Al-Qaeda fighters. And uh, so Mike and, uh, and they already had them, you know, sitting in like rows out on the courtyard that morning. And this is shown on the video. And uh, Mike and uh, his partner show up then, uh, and I'm uh, guessing that the time frame is between, you know, 8 to 8.30 in the morning, according to what uh, Dostum's men 
told me over there. And the video is uh, approximately, I guess, two, two and a half hours long. Uh, sometimes after, during the, uh, when Mike and uh, uh, the other CIA operative got on site, and they were going through the ranks of the uh, people sitting on the courtyard and, you know, looking at them and talking to them and trying to ask them questions, trying to, I guess, help determine, are you right? Is this guy from Karachi or is this guy from Pakistan or wherever? And uh, then they started uh, having some of the men brought off separately. And that's actually how the John Walker Lynn, uh, the first encounter with him came about, that um, they pulled him out some probably 50 or 60 feet away from the rest of them and the blanket on the ground there. And uh, his arms were tied behind his back. Uh, but Mike was asking him, you know, who he was and where was he at? Where was, uh, why was he, what was he doing there? And of course, John Walker Lynn would never answer. Uh, he would never say anything because I guess he knew that they would realize that he was an American if he did. And, uh, not knowing for sure, I think they had a suspicion that he maybe he was American, according to uh, what Mike's partner told me. Mm-hmm. Um, but they couldn't prove it for sure. And uh, so that was one of the little snippets of the uh, news uh, that was released uh, when they brought John Walker Lynn out of the basement house later after he retreated back inside. And uh, So I saw that video, well, and uh, I believe that mm-hmm. was... That was Mike, and it seemed like it showed Mike kind of pull John Walker Lynn's hair back. Is that right? Because it was pretty long. No, Mike never did put, touch him. Uh, okay. One of one of the Northern Lights guys, Mike asked him, the other guy, to pull his hair back so he could take a photo of him. Okay. And the Northern Lights guy did. You know, he sort of like pulled his hair back and held it back because it was long, and Mike took a snapshot of him on his phone. I mean, okay. not on his phone, on his camera. Yeah. But Mike never uh, never touched him or you know did the hair deal himself. He did you know ask him to pull his hair back and uh, the Northern Lights guy to do that for him. Uh, as the uh, as the video goes on, of course, I think the the parts of the video you saw was the three parts that was actually sold to the U.S. news stations. I Is guess so. It, like was, the, it was a weird yeah. uh, YouTube channel, so I, I guess so. I was wondering where they came from. Yeah, was it uh, several minutes long, or did you just see the short version? I think I saw a short version. Yeah. What What happened there was after uh, after the uprising and, and Mike's death, and uh, some four days later, when they actually when Dostum got on site and they flooded the basement house with water to get the uh, prisoners to come out of the basement house. And John Walker Lynn had retreated back inside there with some of the other guys when the uprising started. And uh, the U.S. news stations, uh, actually what happened, the the guy that was taking the video was one of Dostum's men. And he had sold it to one of the war reporters that was over there. His name was Damien. And this is sort of a long story is how I traced that down through uh, a news reporter out of Georgia that came over to do a documentary and asked her that, you know, to, if she ever found out who had it, you know, that I wanted to see the whole film. And she's the one that called me, talk, called me and told me that Damien had the film. And when I got in touch with Damien and told him I wanted to see the whole video, uh, then he informed me that uh, he had already sold it to Kapal TV, and at that time, that's how the U.S. news stations got it. Kapal TV sold uh, two or three, you know, short snippets, like a minute and a half long, each one of them, out of that to the new U.S. Uh, three new U.S. U.S. news stations, and that's the thing that you saw on TV. Okay, uh, I think there's like three different uh, little small parts of it. And it's just because that John Walker Lynn was an, an American, and that's they wanted to make that public. Uh, but anyway, that uh, that morning as they were doing that, um, all over in the morning, um, what uh, 
there was a, 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 a author uh, that wrote the book, uh, My Heart Became Attached is the name of the book he wrote. And uh, he told me that he interviewed several uh, Afghan people and prisoners that were there. And he actually had somebody to go to Sherbagon Prison uh, where two of the prisoners were held and not brought to Guantanamo because they were hurt too bad. Their injuries were too bad to make the trip. And that those prisoners that were left there told his people that the night before that the uprising was planned uh, and that uh, you had to make a conscious decision how much you were going to be involved in it, that it really wasn't a surrender. It was just a Trojan horse type thing. And uh, so the way the the, uh, uprising started was several of the prisoners that were left inside the pink house, and there was about half of them, I'm, I'm thinking, from the counts that I had been told, uh, I was told by the people that were over there, the Northern Lights people, that they had a count of 708 people all together, all prisoners all, all told. And there's about half of them that were still left inside the uh, basement house when the uh, uprising started. And that there was, uh, well, this is verified not the number, but how the uprising actually started is verified by the prisoners' reports from Guantanamo Bay. And they were released because of the Freedom of Information Act. And when the proper paperwork was filed and that got released, then we had reports of the from the prisoners in Guantanamo that gave an account of what happened that morning. And... Uh, of course, during this period of time, uh, I was also, I'd, I'd talked to the people in Afghanistan because we'd gone there for a memorial service. And uh, I had talked to the two doctors that were on the courtyard in the last one minute before the uprising started. Mike was standing behind them and they were kneeling on the ground tending to some of the prisoners that were brought to them that were, you know, needing medical attention, like, you know, bandaging them up and things like that. So I knew that the two doctors were there, and they were the last ones to see Mike because they were, he was like one foot looking over their shoulders, you know, standing right behind them. And one minute later, you just can count the seconds off as the camera pans away from him to the front of the pink house, and then you hear a muffled grenade or a muffled bang, and, and, you know, you could tell it wasn't a a grenade. It was out in the open. Mm -hmm. And then the prisoners' reports verified that one of the prisoners there, and it goes back to the people that's left at Shubhagan saying they had it planned, and the guy was had a grenade inside the basement house, and he was going to throw it out the window. This basement house, uh, the pink house, the top part of it, the windows were long and tall, and so from inside there, you could you know, this big stairwell, you could see these windows that led out onto the courtyard where they were putting all these prisoners and where Mike and the Northern Lights guys that was uh, talking to the prisoners as they brought them out of the uh, pink house. And his deal was that he was supposed to throw the grenade out. Uh, and basically the where he was throwing it was right where Mike and the two doctors were at. But he missed the window opening, and it bounced back inside. And this is verified with those prisoner reports. And when that happened, and we hear it, you hear the grenade go off on the video, and then the video cuts off. And uh, I asked the guy that was taking the video what happened, and he said that he said I, I turned it off and ran, you know, because it instantaneously when the grenade went off inside the pink house all the prisoners that were out on the courtyard in the rows that they had segregated them out in, they all jumped up and started uh, rushing Mike and the other Northern Lights uh, people that was up there and untying each other because, remember, I told you that their elbows were tied behind their back. Uh -huh. Their hands were in front of them. Their hands were free. So 
one prisoner could back up to the other one, you know, and he could untie him. And uh, it wasn't a very secure way, but it was the Afghan way of doing things. And uh, so, so, do, so to back up a minute, do you think, based on all the people you've talked to now, did Mike and his any of his team have any sus- suspicions that they were planning an uprising? No. Okay. Not at that time. The, none of them tell me they did. Uh, <clears throat> most of the team uh, was somewhere between Mazar Sharif and Kanduz. And the SF team, the 12 man SF team, uh, were the same way. The majority of them was over at Kanduz also because that's where all the activity, the prisoners was like about six or 7,000 prisoners that was uh, actually surrendered. It was, uh, the, the whole thing was, you know, Coming down. So where was Johnny staying? I mean, I'm sorry. Where was Mike staying? You know, was Mike, he? Mike was staying in the Turkey schoolhouse. They, they had moved out of College Yangi. That's where their headquarters were at when they went up the valley and liberated the Mazar Sharif and went through College Yangi at that time. And uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda forces had been there. That's where they had, had been staying also. And when they came through and uh, ran them all out, and they all fled from there and went over to Kanduz. And then on the day that I talked to Michael, Thanksgiving Day, he was he told me that they were moving all of their gear out from College Angie that day to the Turkey Schoolhouse, which is about a three or four miles, five miles probably away from College Angie. And it was just, a, and I think your other guy that you talked to there uh, called it a, some other kind of school, but I was told it was a Turkey Schoolhouse. It's a three-story building, small building, but, you know, narrow and not very deep, but it was tall. And uh, the CIA operatives, uh, they had the top floor. And uh, the special forces, uh, 12 special, the special forces team, they had, I think they were on the second floor. And then I think some of the other, the officers and things on the first floor, I think. I'm not real sure. I just know Mike and his crew was on the top floor. And that's where they were actually staying. Okay. And uh, they went over there. The day that when I talked to Mike, he just, I think I told you before that he had told me that he was, he knew the prisoners, were, some of them were going to be brought back to uh, the Missouri Sharif area, and he was going to go over on Sunday and uh, try to get some information off of them. He felt sure that, you know, it was going to be right. uh, people there that knew where Bin Laden or uh, would certainly be able to help them track him. So, uh, <clears throat> I guess I'm sort of jumping around here a little bit, but yeah, so the bomb the, went uh, off. Sorry, yeah, the grenade went off, and yeah, the grenade went off. And uh, the first accounting I had of it was, of course, when I watched the video, I, I, I knew that you know one minute before that muffled grenade, you know, went off, and I could tell it was muffled, and all the hollering and screaming, you know, the Alak Bar stuff and all that kind of stuff was being screamed uh, just before the video cut off, and that was one minute since the camera had been facing Mike and it was looking at the two doctors working on people on the ground and Mike was standing right behind them looking over their shoulder and the camera had panned around to the front of the building and you saw another guard go inside the pink house and had time to take probably three steps and and then that's when the grenade went off and so I knew that uh, you know nobody could tell me at that point what they couldn't fill in the blanks, you know, they just, you know, the mic was attacked. And then, uh, when I was there and talking to the, uh, uh, I asked General Dostum to let me talk to the two doctors that had been on the courtyard that day and they brought them to us. And I listened to their account of what happened and they pretty much, well, they did. They said that, you know, they were, Mike was, you know, behind them and, that uh, their grenade goes off and they fall on the, the ground. And they think that, you know, because all the chaos starts immediately. It's not like the bomb, the uh, grenade goes off and three minutes later, it's like instantaneously. Like, okay, w- this is playing, you know, the grenade goes off and everybody goes crazy. So they fell on the ground and thought that, you know, well, this is the end of us. It's what they were telling me that they were thinking. 
And uh, I said, well, what was what was Mike doing? And they said he's when that happened, that he advanced toward the basement house and uh, started firing with his AK. And that uh, uh, they were swarming out, you know, of the basement house. The prisoners were. And they had uh, taken the weapons away from the northern lights that were there, the ones that hadn't uh, turned and ran back to the top of the College Angie walls. And uh, the ones that was on the courtyard were rushing him from the backside because by that time, you know, they jumped up and started rushing him. Some with their elbows still tied and some that had, you know, managed to untie each other, you know. And that uh, then one of the doctors said uh, that uh, he was firing with his AK and that he had uh, his clip and ran out but rather than to reclip it he, he had a sidearm on his side and then he pulled his clock and started firing with it and that he was just overcome there was so many of them that they just you know was rushing him and overcame him and it was taking him to the ground as he uh, uh, you know was running away mm-hmm. and he ran behind uh, uh, some canisters there it was fairly closed and then hollered for his buddy, the other doctor, to run too. And so I asked the second doctor what he saw, and he said, when I looked up to run, that uh, Mike was going to the ground, that they had beat him down to the ground at that point. And uh, that's the last thing he saw, that you know, when they got to, he got to the canister, then they uh, took off out of the uh, courtyard into the northern part of the uh, College Yangi. And uh, so that was the last time that Mike was seen. Mike's partner uh, told us that the last time he saw Mike, that he was fighting and he was conscious, but he was, you know, just covered up with people. Uh, and he had, uh, Mike had, he'd heard Mike holler, you know, like, I need some help over here. Yeah. And then there was also some controversy or not controversy, some just straight out lies. Like we had one reporter, actually the reporter that called me and told me, he's with LA Times, he called me and told me, he said, Mr. Spann, have you seen the uh, prisoner's report from Guantanamo? And I said, no, I didn't know they'd been released. He said, well, they have, and said, they're online. He said, I'll go ahead and send them to you, but this is where you can go online and print them off. So he faxes me, his copies, and same time I'm going on the internet and printing them off. So I've got them just like he's got them, you know. And so he wants to come out to talk to me. He comes out, and we spend two days here in Winfield, and we're going over those reports, you know, and the reports are verifying exactly what I'd been told, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, you know, we we talked about that – the prisoners were so, uh, they were like pretty detailed as far as saying uh, the uh, American that wore the uh, uh, cape or the gown type, you know, Afghan uh, garb, uh, the tall one that had that on, you know, uh, did this, and the other one that had the blue jeans on, you know, was the such and such place and those kind of things. And Mike had blue jeans on and a little Columbia top. And the other guy, uh, he had the uh, uh, Afghan uh, sort of robe type deal on. And very, uh, you know, one of them's like four or five, six inches taller than the other one. So it's very easy to determine who who was who. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, and it it says, and which the other guy had already told me, that when all the chaos broke out and he hears Mike call, I need some help over here that he was sorted back toward the back of the pack and one of the prisoners lunged at him. They were sitting on the ground and one jumped at him when that happened and he said he pulled his pistol out and shot the guy. Well, this guy from L.A., L.A. Times, goes back to L.A. and then he writes an article in like three days. It comes out in L.A. Times that Mike Spann uh, died because of an uprising that he instigated by shooting a prisoner in the head. Oh my gosh! I mean, just you know. So I went berserk. I went to the. I went. I flew to D.C. and 
uh, went to the Associated Press, you know, and carried my tapes with me and carried the prisoner reports and everything and showed them, you know, that now this is what happened, you know, that this thing was planned. It didn't happen because Mike shot a prisoner in the head. There was a prisoner shot, but it was because it was after the grenade went off and when they started the uprising, when, you know, when they were rushing them. Yeah. And, <laughs> but, and the, LA, and the uh, Associated Press wrote a little thing that said, uh, didn't retract anything. The only thing they put on there was that, and they had picked up the story, see, from the LA Times. They just put in a little small article that said that I, uh, was contesting what was being said that that wasn't right and those kind of things and you know nothing was ever said about that i brought the tapes to him and the reports to him and proved to him and showed him you know that uh there was a grenade and went off and that the grenades what started the uprising and it was planned you just don't throw a grenade try to throw one out a window <laughs> and it right. bounced back on you and all the prisoners on the courtyard start attacking everybody instantaneously you know mm-hmm. and then the part that uh uh, Cookus's book, the one that he wrote about John Walker Lynn, uh, specifically said that uh, his people visited those two people in the prison, and that's what they had told them. So that's basically what happened. Uh, that, that, that's what I was told that happened that day. Of course, there's a lot of you know small things in between uh, details that would take a long time to describe every little thing, but. Uh, but that Mike, is what basically, in the Mike basically, Mike um, basically, did he empty his mag? I mean, I, he 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 got he, off a lot of rounds. The doctors, anyway. yeah, the doctors told me that he emptied his AK, and rather than putting another clip in it, that he pulled his handgun and started firing with it. But he was being overtaken from behind and in the front. That yeah. all of them were rushing. Mike was the only one that was shooting at him. Mike was the only one that was doing anything. The doctors told me, and I'm not trying to, you know, toot Mike's horn. The doctors told me that uh, if Mike hadn't advanced and engaged the prisoners, that they would have all died that day. <clears throat> and that, it, that the only reason they were able to get out is because Mike engaged them, and they were trying to get Mike down and kill him. And at that end, let them have time to leave. There was uh, the two guys, the two Afghans that were right there at the front of the uh, basement house lived. When I went to Afghanistan, this is the first two people I saw was the little bald-headed intelligence guy and the uh, what we call the stick man, the sort of the officer that wore the uh, military cap. And uh, my my first thought when I saw them was I, was I was thinking, how you were between Mike and, and the pink house, how could you be living? And, uh, but after uh, the, what I'm understanding, just like the guy that was doing the video, when it started, everybody ran, everybody ran except Mike stayed and fought to allow the rest of them to get out. If Mike had turned and ran himself back to the back of the courtyard and, uh, got out of there rather than standing his ground, uh, he'd be living today. And, but there'd be a lot of those other folks dead. Um, oh. uh, a lot of, uh, there was actually some uh, Red Cross workers that were there too, and there was a lot of folks there that could have died or would have died if he hadn't uh, engaged them. And I'm not I'm just making that up and saying it. That's what the records show. Yeah. That's what the prisoners said. So, how did you get? How were you notified of his death? And and how how many days or how many hours passed? After his death, did you find out? Well, on Sunday morning, uh, when I we got up uh, on the news, uh, it was they were saying that there had been a prison uprising in Mazar Sharif, is what they were saying. They didn't say College Yangi; they said Mazar Sharif, and that it was reported that two Americans were inside and that one was had gotten out and that they didn't know the fate of the other one. So when I heard that and I remembered what Mike had told me about he was going up to get information that weekend and I knew he was in the Turkey schoolhouse. I knew he was close to it, uh, Mazari Sharif and 
the proximity of the Turkey Schoolhouse and Mazar and College Yankees were then like four or five miles of each other. And it's sort of in a triangle looking thing if you looked at it on the map. So I knew that there was a 50 50 chance at that point that one of those Americans was Mike. And according to what he had told me. Mm. And so <clears throat> I started to uh, find, uh, I, I was actually calling his wife <clears throat> to start with to find out if she knew anything, if she had gotten any news. And uh, she was in California at the time visiting some uh, relatives that was, was having a birthday party or something for one of the older relatives. And she had gone out there with and took Jake with her. And I had came back to Winfield. I was in D.C., but I came back to Winfield to uh, see my two daughters because it was Thanksgiving. I, I flew back in on Saturday to have Thanksgiving with them uh, on Sunday or Saturday night. And uh, so they went ahead and, and left. Uh, they didn't understand what was going on. I didn't tell them at that time. Uh Tammy and Randy went on to church, left to go to church, and Tanya's uh, daughter was sick, and uh, she was going to drive back to Montgomery at the time. And so just as soon as they left, I get back on the TV again, and I'm calling Shannon and asking her if she's heard anything, but I can't get in touch with her because she's up in the mountains. And so about somewhere around 2 o'clock that afternoon, on Sunday afternoon, uh, I did. She called me and said she had gotten my message. I had left her on her phone and that she had uh, tried to call the uh, CIA office in Langley, but that they weren't answering her calls. That she couldn't get anybody on the phone. And she said, "I don't understand that." And I said, "Well, I do. It's because either they don't know what to tell you, or it's bad news and they can't tell you." And I said, "Just please call me back." as soon as you know you do hear something and so it's like a minute or two to five that afternoon uh, say two or three minutes before five that uh one of the agency guys knocked on my door rang my doorbell and uh, i just got off the phone with shannon she'd just called me back at that point and told me that uh, she had gotten a call back from langley and that they told her that they had people coming to her dad's house in california and had some folks come to my house and she was crying and she said that don't that don't sound good and i said no shannon this that won't sound good at all if they've got people coming to our houses that means mike's the ones inside and uh, so i knew you know pretty much then that it was mike but then when the guy knocked on my door he he told me he said our last word was that mike was last time he was seen that he was fighting and he was conscious and he said we can't tell you that he's dead, but the chances of him being alive are very slim. And uh, that was on Sunday night around five o'clock. And when and, was uh, he? When was he? Was it Saturday when the fighting was? When the uprising happened? No, that, it actually happened uh, on Sunday morning, Afghanistan time. Now remember the time change in uh, differential from Alabama to there. It would have been like two o'clock in the morning. About nine and a half Saturday hours morning. difference, roughly, yeah. something like that. Okay. Yeah, it had been around around two o'clock on Saturday night here. Okay. And it hit, hit the news. It was being told on the American news stations the next morning uh, around ten ten thirty. It was the first that I heard it. So then we didn't uh, we didn't know for sure if Mike was dead or alive then until Sun uh, not Sunday but Tuesday night. Uh, right at, I'm saying it was right at 11 o'clock that they walked into my den and they'd been out on the front porch, you know, making calls every few minutes the whole time they were here, uh, trying to get updates. And at that time, that was early morning over there. And, uh, it was Tuesday night here. It was Wednesday morning there, real early in the morning. And they had, uh, had another crew to go in and was able to recover Mike's body at that point, and he was deceased. So did the, for, first of all, who did they send to your home, and did they stay with you in Winfield the whole time? Did they, did they? Yeah, it was, it was a CIA. It was some CIA operatives that uh, worked for the CIA. Okay. It was actually one one of the, the guys that was uh, uh, 
part of the team, but had came back to the, uh, uh, one of the leaders of the team, not one of the eight man team, but one of them was over that section. Uh, and I think he was actually and had gone to Georgia to visit his family and they contacted him. And since he was the closest one to Winfield, he came to Winfield and the next morning we had some more people show up we had about three and they all stayed at the house and with us until you know, the, we got the final word. Okay. Wow. Um, I'm guessing that Mike's request before he deployed, he must have told them he wanted you notified if something happened to them. Well, um, actually what happened, uh, I think one of the young ladies that worked at the CIA was friends with Mike's wife, who was also a CIA employee. And she was uh, off on maternity leave. Jake was only uh, six months old when Mike died. And so he was about five months old when he left. And I think they had decided or he had asked the late one of the ladies that worked in Shannon's department that if anything happened to him that she'd be the one to go and tell her. And at the same time, she was on her way to California to tell Shannon they were sending this guy here to my house. Okay. And so I don't know all the details as far as if he told them, you know, what to do or what. But I do know that it was his instructions to the young lady uh, that she be the one to go tell Shannon if anything happened to her, okay. to him. Okay. So um, I'm interested in this. How did you arrange this trip to Afghanistan? Why did you go and how did you make this happen? And then, and then to be able to meet with General Dostum as well. Well, it, it all started, uh, the final trip, uh, I guess was planned by, uh, and I don't know the motivation behind it. I was during the period of time of, uh, after Mike's, uh, death, uh, and shortly into 2002, you know, I was doing a, quite a bit of talking and, uh, bitching on the phone and on TV stations and anybody else that would listen to me about John Walker Lynn because I, I felt like he was a traitor. He was an American. He was sitting there on the courtyard and all he had to do was tell Mike that, hey, I'm an American. Uh, th I've made a terrible mistake. You need to get us out of here because they're fixing the, they're, they're going to be an uprising. You know, you, yeah. need, you need to get me out of here and you need to get out of here. All that's all he had to do. If he just if he had just told him, and he knew it, it wasn't a fact. He didn't know it. He knew about it. This was already proved, and uh, by the other people that uh, talked about that, they had to make a decision. Everybody that was in the basement house had to make a decision on Saturday night how much they were going to participate in it. And, you know what their feelings were. And so I was uh, in the news media a lot, and uh, going to uh, Alexandria uh, to. Uh, uh, try to testify and, and ask the judge to let me speak at the trial and at the sentencing hearing, you know, to, so they could hear my side as far as what I, the family thought that ought to happen to him and those kind of things. But at the same time, I, I, it was like, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a real short story that will maybe sort of explain to you how I felt. I had a friend that came by my office, uh, probably a month afterwards when I was back in Winfield, I guess it was January, maybe February. And my friend that stopped as I was going into my office, he pulled up front and I walked out to his pickup truck and sat down in the truck with him. And he said, John, I said, you know, you, you're going to have to sort of let this go. You know, Mike's dead. And, you know, you're not going to be able to, uh, basically, you know, you're not going to be able to find anything out anymore. And, my answer to him was, because he had a son too, my answer to him was, I said, you know, if your son was on his way to fit and he died in an auto accident, I feel sure that you'd want to know, did he die because of something he did? Did he run off the road and hit somebody? Did a drunk driver hit him? Was it just a pure accidental? Did they have a blowout and he wreck and die? Did he die on the ground? Did he die in the ambulance? Or did he die when he got to the hospital? 
I said, I got a feeling that you'd want to know those things. The only difference in that scenario and what's happened to me is, and what happened to Mike is Mike's 8,000 miles away. And it's going to be harder for me to find those things out. I can't just drive over there. So immediately I started trying to make contacts. And the, the first contact was with a uh, war reporter named Dodge Billingsley. Uh, Dodge Billingsley had sent me uh, some videos. He wasn't inside uh, Colin Jangi, but he was outside of Colin Jangi when the uprising was going on. And so he had... and afterwards after the uprising had started and you know to monday tuesday and wednesday and on and he had sent me his videos and i think there were six of them if i'm not mistaken mistaken and you can actually see those online because he put them online later and uh so he was you know became sort of a friend and i could ask him questions and talk to him and he had told me that he was uh, preparing to go back he was actually had came to the states and he was actually going back and uh, so I told him I wanted him to take me with him. I wanted to go. And he, uh, first, he agreed. He said, okay, yeah, uh, I'll do that. So it's going to be, you know, another 30, 40 days. I can't remember the amount of days. And so then uh, when it got closer and closer, and I, I started, you know, was asking, you know, when are we going to go? And he said, uh, he told me one day, he said, Mr. Spann said, I just can't take you and be responsible for you. He said, things are just still too dangerous. Uh, you know, you just don't, you do not need to go. And so, you know, he refused to take me. So then uh, there was another instance uh, a couple of months after that that we had a uh, gentleman uh, that was from California and he had friends that were Afghans that were actually living in the States and they still had family in uh, Cabal. And I won't go into all the details as how they contacted me, but they contacted me and asking for different things to happen. And uh, as a favor to me, then they were going to take me to Afghanistan. And I uh, first thought, well, that's, that's a good that's a good idea because you know they got family in Cabal and uh, they'll have somebody there, you know. Then whatever I felt, I felt, I wanted to go so bad. I was like, you know, I couldn't see any dangers. And, uh, so then we got a, oh, I got a, uh, call one day from him or I called him. I don't know which way it was. It's one way or the other. And, uh, the Afghan that was in the States and I was, was talking about, you know, when, when we're going, you know, what, when do we need to make the plane tickets and, uh, whatever, and he he told me, he said, you'll need to take about $10,000 with you. And I said, what for? I, I thought you said we were going to be staying at your folks in Cabal. He said, yeah, but said, you're going to have to, you know, you'll have to spend some money, and $10,000 is a lot of money in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> so I, I thought about it a little bit, you know, and so I called some of Mike's buddies that was in the Marine Corps that I had met and knew, and, and they were officers, and I uh, I was pretty close to him, and I called uh, one of them up the first time, and I said, you know, look, this is what's happening. And he said, Mr. Spann said, just please listen to me. The very best that can come out of this is that you'd come back alive without your money. But the most, most likely what can happen is that you're not going to come back and your money's not going to come back. And I'm begging you, don't go. So I listened to him and uh, I, I called the guy back and I said, look, you know, this is not going to work out because, you know, I had no idea he was going to want $10,000. I said, I can't understand what we'd have to have $10,000 for. And he started telling me again, we'd have to pay people to do this and do that and whatever. And I thought his family was going to help me. So then that, uh, sort of fell by the wayside. Then I had a one of the news stations call me, and they had heard that I wanted to go, and they were bringing a new uh, morning uh, guy on their show, and they wanted to open up. Uh, they were going to bring him in like 30 days from the day they was talking to me, a month or two months later, and they offered to take me to Afghanistan, and it wouldn't cost me anything. They would foot the bill. Uh, but the only thing was that 
they would be in charge. You know, they would have to film me. They would have to film who I talked to. Uh, they would be calling the shots the whole way. And I didn't like that scenario at all because, you know, I didn't know. I didn't trust the news media to start with. And I didn't want them telling me who I could talk to. And, and, the, and the next thing is, I didn't know what I was going to hear. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, you know, I wanted it, I wanted to hear it. I didn't want the world to hear it at the same time I heard it. And uh, so I refused. I just told them that. That's, that's not the way I'm going to do it. So then, lo and behold, like two or three weeks later, well, uh, uh, there was a group. And, and, and I don't know how much of all this, uh, uh, but there was supposedly a group of... Uh, that got together and decided that there was a memorial being built in College Yangi by General Dostum, and uh, they was gonna they were gonna have a dedication ceremony the following week in Afghanistan, and sent me a picture of it and in the stage it was in at that point it wasn't completely finished they still liked several days work on it and told me that. Uh, you know, where it was at and all this kind of stuff. And I said, well, how come I'm just now hearing about this? Because I would have certainly liked to have tried to go to that. And I said, are you serious? You want to go? And I said, sure. So he said, this is a guy that called me and told me, he said, well, you know, I don't know if I'm arranged or not. Let me call you back. So then he calls me back uh, in a little bit. And he says, um, well, you know, we may be able to, to uh, fund that trip for you, but you over there. Uh, do you think some of your family, like, does Shannon want to go? And I said, yeah, I'm sure Shannon would like to go, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Mike's mom would like to go. So they wound up, uh, me and Mike's mother, Gail, and Shannon, Mike's wife, and Mike's oldest daughter, Allison. Uh, we flew to New York, and from, from New York over to uh, Uzbekistan, we through we stopped in Kiev and then on, over into Uzbekistan, and uh, the uh, I think there was um, six people that went with us. You know, people that knew what was going on, I guess. Or uh, uh, and one of them was one of the uh, guys that worked for one of the senators. You know that he was uh, knew about Afghanistan. I guess he was pretty well versed in the stuff and the languages and things. And uh, General Dostum sent some people up to the border uh, at Termez and uh, escorted us into Afghanistan. And so that's how we got into Afghanistan. And the first night that we were there, uh, Dostum met us there at the compound, at one of his compounds that we were staying in. And uh, he asked me what he could do. Uh, for me while I was there and I uh, told him that you know I wanted to uh, uh, the main thing was I wanted to uh, to see the two doctors that was on the video and I wanted the copy of the video I had a copy of the video but they didn't know it and it wasn't a real good copy it was one that would bootlegged and whatever because it was already it had been sold so I was having to get the video uh, separately and that's a long story about that but I'd already seen the video, but I wanted the original video. And uh, so he he made those things happen for me and uh, was very informative as far as, you know, he, he didn't he didn't speak English, so we had to speak through his interpreter. But, uh, and, and you never know for sure, you know, if, if everything that, you, that you're told is the absolute truth. Right. Um, but you ask things and the things that I already knew, you know, if they told me something that I knew that I'd already researched and knew it wasn't the truth, then I could say, cause like when I asked for the video, they told me there wasn't a video and we got, it was sort of a heated argument because we were sitting at this big table and about 25 people in the room and he was telling me there was no video. And I said, yes, there is a video. I've already seen it. Hell, the whole world seen two or three minutes of it. You know, don't tell me a lie like this. And so it got sort of heated. But then the next morning, uh, they came to me and told me that they had some, a group of people coming to bring me some stuff that night, in which was the video, the original video. Do you think they appreciated you standing up to them and being firm? 
Well, I think I think he's in a difficult situation. I think that uh, he was probably told and uh, probably didn't want to. I don't I don't really know. Uh, I think at some point uh, maybe the CIA guys that were there uh, maybe told him some hair that you why lie to him because you know he's already seen it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I, I don't know. But it was a no-win situation for him because I had seen it. And Kapal TV had sold. I knew they had it because Damien had already told me I'd followed him into France. And he told me that he couldn't give it to me because he sold it to Kapal TV. And so I talked to the guy that actually took it out of Afghanistan. And uh, so I, I'd already, I, knew, I knew quite a bit about it. But I wanted the uncut. I wanted the original version. I wanted to see exactly because I kept thinking that there would be more to one of the tapes than what I had already seen. That there might be some of the fighting on it. Yeah. You know, the, when the uprising started and still the guy telling me. But I got to meet the guy that took the video and uh, I asked him several questions and uh, he, he uh, you know, he could have lied to me, but he told me that. He cut the video off when the grenade went off because he said, I ran. Yeah. I didn't want to die. I ran. And, uh, so what did you learn from that visit that you didn't already know? Uh, nothing. I don't guess uh, just a visual uh, thing of uh, being able to walk to the point that they said this is approximately within four or five feet where the uh, guys said they picked Mike's body up. Uh, Getting to see uh, where the pink house was, what it looked like actually, uh, walking inside of it, uh, looking out the window that the grenade was supposed to go out of, uh, seeing the people that Mike worked with in Afghanistan, uh, the people that... uh, uh, a lot of the guys that, you know, I guess, I don't know for sure that he recruited any of them or whatever, but, you know, according to several of them that they worked closely with Mike and, and all the uh, uh, CIA officers there, the, the eight people that was there, and, and also the 12 men uh, special forces, they were pretty much a close-knit group because they were the first ones, Alpha team were the first ones to hit the ground in hostile territory, and they were the first ones to link up with Jim Dostum. And they were the first ones that actually fought, uh, started the fight going up the Dar Sioux Valley and into Missouri Sharif to liberate it. Uh, I know that there's other people, and, and they're legitimate horse soldiers because they rode horses too, but uh, Alpha team and uh, ODA. 595 were the first ones to hit inside hostile territory, and they're the ones that actually linked up with General Dostum, according to General Dostum, according to the 595 members and the Alpha Team members, and according to General Mulholland and all these other guys that uh, that I've met, uh, military people that all say the same thing. So it was what I learned was. And it's been a learning process for 15 years because, you know, uh, but when you start putting that puzzle together and all the stuff that's written in books is not always true. And I had to find that out. And, and, you know, Senator uh, Shelby told me something early on and I was talking with him. He was actually in, uh, it's on his trip here in Alabama and, I met him up in Carbon Hill. I was out showing the houses or something, and, and uh, that was the closest point to where he was at. And uh, he was going out to uh, to the parking lot when I pulled up, and we talked for a little bit. And, and he's asking me things about, you know, how things were going. And Senator uh, uh, Shelby was always, as Senator Sessions was, they were right there, you know, for the family. Um, what can we do? What can we help you with? Mm-hmm. And, you know, let us know. And I, I just don't, I have the biggest, most utmost respect for both of them because of the way they handled themselves and 
but he said to me, he, I told him that I was having a little hard time trying to get some details and uh, things. And he said, Johnny said, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to get them to tell you a lot of things because a lot of stuff's classified. And, uh, you know, they're going to have to tell you some stuff probably is not true because they can't tell you the truth. He said, I don't know that to be the way it is, but it, it could be. And uh, so I walked away from got in my car that day, and I realized that I didn't need to be asking the authorities. Uh, I needed to start asking people that were actually involved. Yeah. And that that encouraged me at that point. The next thing I started doing was there was a book that was actually published, uh, The Hunt for Bin Laden. I don't know if you've read that book no, or not. No, I haven't. But – in that book, Mr. Moore was the uh, author of it, and he had written in that book that Mike was captured and he was tortured. <clears throat> and we were always told that he was not tortured. And when we saw Mike's body, uh, I, you know, cut, you know, you, how do you examine somebody's body that's dead, you know, uh, in a casket? Yep. But I, you know, I felt of his legs, his hands, his toes, his fingers and you know i couldn't uh, that i could that there didn't seem to be anything missing uh and i could see where his uh, had been shot in the head and i knew his head was all busted up you know where the um uh, from the back of it in the front um uh, and i was being told no and i was also talking to one of the guys that actually helped bring mike's body out of the fortress and he was telling me, he said, look, you know, I didn't gaze at his body, but I'm telling you, he was on the courtyard and he was not tortured as far as I could tell. So anyway, but you've got somebody who uh, wrote a book and they're saying that they know for a fact that he was. And so, you know, that's one of the things I was, the CIA guys and all my friends there and Mike's buddies were all telling me, look, don't even read the book. That's, it's just a book. They they write books to make them sell, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that was one of the things. So when I left Senator uh, Shelby up there and got home that night, I started calling over to uh, uh, Germany. Uh, I wanted to find I, – I, I didn't know for sure that there had been an autopsy made on Mike's body because I told them that I didn't think it was a need to because we knew where Mike was at when he died. <clears throat> and uh, so I didn't know that until I was told in a night meeting that I had had, uh, I was in D.C. and I asked to visit with uh, uh, George Tennant and, and uh, there's actually three other guys there and just asking questions and things. And, and I was told that night that, they knew something, particular things I was asking about because of the autopsy. And that was the first I knew about it. So thinking about, well, you know, if I could see the autopsy, I would know if Mike's body was tortured, if they're lying to me about that. So I sat up at night and to be able to talk to him in months, well, I'd, you know, I'd have to make calls here two or three o'clock in the morning. So I started calling and, uh, First, and it took about a month, I guess, four or five weeks, to get anybody convinced that I had a right to see the autopsy. Yeah. And I had been given a copy of one, but I didn't think it was complete, and it wasn't. And uh, so when I was able to get the autopsy in my hands, and the autopsy said that there was photos of Mike's body when it arrived at Lunstall, and that uh, they were on file there, and uh, who the doctor was that examined Mike's body, and you know, blah blah blah, and all this other stuff that gets along with that. And they describe, you know, the wounds that he had, then, and what the things that were actually accompanied Mike's body there. And it talked about the different things that was presented to them when they presented Mike's body. And some of it made me think that, well, maybe, you know, there's a possibility he could have been tied up and tortured because of some things that was presented. 
so <clears throat> I started calling again and was able to, the, the photographer was no longer there, and the doctor that did the autopsy was no longer there, but I was able to, I got real lucky, actually. Uh, I wound up after, I don't know, six or eight, ten calls, I guess. I, I lost track of them, emails and calls together because some of them would be emails and some of them I'd just call and try to get a hold of somebody. But I was able to find this one guy, and he was actually uh, from uh, Alabama, and he was working there. And I convinced him that I needed to see the photos. And uh, he was real hesitant to do it. And uh, But I was able to get those sent to my doctor, to Mike's doctor. And then the doctor gave him the name. And so, you know, you, you don't know what to do. I, I say you don't know what to do. You don't know if you want to do what you think you want to do. Uh, I was saying, you know, be careful of what you ask for. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, uh, when I, when they delivered the, uh, CD to my office that day, they called me and told me that it came in and that they'd drop it by. And I brought it home and I got home that day about five thirty, six o'clock. And it was about 10 o'clock before I got the guts to <sighs> put it in my computer and look at it. Uh, wow. I can't imagine because you know, we, we've thought about the same thing. So, I mean, how did yeah. you do with it? How did you deal with it? <clears throat> it was, uh, well, I was able to verify that Mike's body had not been tortured. Uh, there was no torture marks. There was no evidence of anything missing. And this was just raw footage, you know, when he, when he arrived there. And that helped me a lot because yeah. the the book had... The book had sort of, I was like 50 50, you know. I didn't know where to believe the book or believe the guys with uh, uh, the CIA, you know. I didn't know. And and then I was able to find a, a gentleman, uh, and he's a friend of mine today, and it's uh, Robert Young Pelton. Uh, you may have heard him, uh, heard of him. I don't know. Uh, Robert was actually in Afghanistan. During that period of time, he was uh, uh, pretty much a, a go-to guy, uh, Dostum, and still is. He's very much involved in Afghanistan now and the going on over there. But uh, I went out to San Diego and uh, visited with him and got some information from him. And while I was there, he gave me the telephone number to contact the author of the book. And I was able to call him and give him a piece of my mind as to what I thought about an author that wrote books that would hurt a family and when he didn't know what he was talking about. Good. And, and but I knew cause I had spent a lot of time and a lot of nights setting up calling and finally getting, uh, photos of an autopsy. So I could actually see for sure what the body looked like when it arrived. And of course he was, he, he had already, uh, sort of ironic in a way because he couldn't, he, all he could do was grunt. He'd have stroke and he couldn't really, uh, talk to me. <laughs> and uh, of course I was pretty pumped up and, uh, I told him that I realized he wasn't in shape to talk to me, but I would, uh, like for him to email me. And I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, to hear what he had to say. He never did email me. And about six months later, uh, I heard that he had passed away. So. And, you know, I don't know that, that it didn't change anything about Mike or the way he died, but it was just the fact that now every time I read something and knowing the stuff, it's like I told you about the L.A. Times and stuff, it's just pure lies that yeah. the guy wrote. And he sat here in my living room on my sofa, and we talked about it and discussed it and read the things and said, yeah, well, that's, you know, not that Mike, this is Mike he's talking about here, and, yeah, this is this happened here, and yeah, the grenade went off first because it was very evident that all the prison reports said that, you know, that's what happened. Yep. The guy threw the, the guy threw the grenade first, and then he goes back to out there and writes a story, and the AP picks it up, and within four or five days, it's all over the, the whole United States and all over the world that Mike started the uprising by shooting one of the prisoners in the head. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I, I, and I was. I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I called him up. I said, I, what in the hell are you talking about? And of course he says, well, that's what I know. It, it's not. Look at your stuff again. 
But anyway, it's uh, as you can tell, he's not my friend. <laughs> he, and and everybody that befriends you is not your friend. That's right. He, he came here and stayed in my house two days, and you know, just like good old boy, and yeah, he wanted to know the truth and all this kind of stuff. And when we and I wanted to know the truth, but you know, when you see it in black and white, and then you write it a different way, and that's unfortunate. That's the way the news media does yeah. sometimes. Well, Mr. Spann, it's been it's been a great time with you. I, I appreciate it. Uh, it. We're here just over an hour, so we we'll probably need to wrap it up. If that's okay. good with you. Sure. Um, but I guess in closing, though, what do you want the world to know about your son, Mike? Um, you know, after 15 years, I'm, I'm uh, uh, and, and during this 15 years, I've had emails from people that have called me some bad names that I won't even say over there here. Uh, they've written me stuff, emails and letters, and I've those letters and emails saying that Mike was a killer, that Mike was a murderer, that he was over there murdering people and blah, 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 and he got what he deserved. And, you know, I've... Uh, I, I've, I've read those things and be so mad if I could get my hands on them, you know, I, I could pull my pistol out and shoot them, you know, <laughs> but I've learned to, uh, I've learned, uh, over the years that, you know, the truth, the truth, and there's going to be people that you pick up the papers every day and listen to the news every day. And you, you, you try to think to yourself, how in the world did they arrive at that? How, how can they think like that? But, you know, that's one of the things that Mike and uh, your brother died for, and that's for our freedoms to say and do and think anything we want to. Uh, but uh, the only thing I can say that I'd like everybody to know is just, you know, read uh, with an open mind and remember that everything you read is not true and everything you hear somebody say is not true. Search for the truth and uh, the people that's... Uh, be kind to the people that are willing to give their lives for your freedom. You know, everybody don't give their life. A lot of people are fortunate and they come back, but you know, they wrote that blank check when they, when they went. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and some people didn't come back. So, you know, be, be kind to the people that's willing to go and offer their life for the things that we enjoy every day.